But this holiest of rituals concealed the unholiest of rows in the House of Windsor leading up to the coronation. Successive monarchs had harnessed the coronation to set the tone for their reign. This ceremony was an opportunity to showcase a thoroughly modern monarchy. Prince Philip was all in favor of a fresh and dynamic style for a new reign, but he was met with a wall of resistance. There were these sort of forces of tradition, and much, much older people, they reigned up against him. Every time he tried to do something, he was slapped down by the old guard of the, the courtiers, even by uh, Queen Mary, who described him on one famous occasion as that damned fool Edinburgh. Unfortunately for Philip, the traditionalists included his new mother-in-law, who was determined that her daughter's reign would be a seamless continuation of her own. The Queen Mother was very protective of her dynasty, and nothing and no one was going to get in the way of that. The scene was set for conflict. In the build-up to the coronation, the two opposing sides, the old and the new, would clash repeatedly. The Queen was caught in the middle. This is London. It is with the greatest sorrow that the King who... Returned On February the 6th, 1952, the BBC announced that King George VI had passed away peacefully in his sleep early that morning. King George VI's premature death at the age of 56 was not only a dreadful loss for his family, for them it marked a traumatic change in their roles and status. BBC offers profound sympathy to Her Majesty the Queen and the Royal Family. Elizabeth, aged only 25, was catapulted prematurely onto the throne. Her coronation would not only sanctify her role as monarch, it was to symbolize a new era in British history. There was a lot made of the prospect that this was going to be the beginning of a new Elizabethan age. Churchill made the point himself, and he referred back to the, 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 the genius of the Tudors and hoped that it was going to occur again. The coronation was to be the perfect tonic for post-war austerity. It showed that a victorious nation had recovered from the Second World War, that peace and prosperity had returned. It also seemed to show that British power was intact. It was a pageant of empire. The stakes were high, and with so many expectations riding on the coronation, 16 months were given to plan and rehearse this event. But to choreograph the royal family's new roles would be an even more demanding task. And the Queen Mother and Prince Philip found they were moving to very different rhythms. He was seen to be a new Prince Albert, a consort for the jet age. The way that he presented himself as a man of science, technology, industry, the future, was part of his own attempt to be taken seriously and to be absolutely at the forefront of how the monarchy was seen. But the Queen Mother saw no need for change and for Philip's jet age dynamism. She was very much a matriarch. She was determined that what she and her late husband had begun was going to continue throughout the 20th century and beyond. And that was a monarchy of tradition, stability, continuity, and probity. The Queen Mother saw her daughter's coronation as a chance to celebrate this. Who organized the coronation and the way that the coronation was organized was all about maintaining tradition, to present an idea of seamless continuity over the centuries. And the main purpose was to get it as close as possible to the coronation of George VI. The Queen's father's coronation had been a deeply traditional display of majesty and archaic ritual. It boosted the confidence of the monarchy, badly shaken after Edward VIII had abandoned his throne to marry Wallace Simpson. 
The Queen Mother joined wholeheartedly in the effort to restore stability to the crown. They were much better qualified than they realized because they had this very good, stable family relationship. And I think also that the British public preferred the kind of um, Sunday lunch, afternoon tea, walk in the park image that the royal family projected to the rather sort of brittle cocktail shaker world of the King Edward VIII and um, Mrs. Simpson. She was charming, she was outgoing, she knew how to talk to people in a very relaxed kind of way. She was a commoner, but she had the magic touch. And people tended to fall in love with her, and I think she did an enormous amount to create the matriarchy which her daughter inherited. She was determined to safeguard the carefully managed image of the royal family that she had projected. On becoming queen, she had turned to London's top society couturier, Norman Hartnell, to rebrand her. And he created her signature look, exuberant layers of crinoline. The new look went on test on a state visit to the style capital of the world, Paris, in July 1938. Unfortunately, three weeks before the, the state visit was to take place, and it was the first state visit of their reign, uh, her mother died. Well, that normally meant court mourning for six months. Well, she couldn't really go to that great fashionable city in black, but um, Queen Mary had actually often worn white in widowhood, and white is also a colour of mourning, and so they interpreted that. And so um, Hartnell then ran her up this fantastic white wardrobe. Queen Elizabeth left London in black and emerged in Paris in white and dazzled them all like mad. Hartnell's designs made the Queen Mother a fashion sensation, the Jackie Kennedy of her day. But the new royal chemistry really began to fizz when the Queen Mother met the infamously gay photographer, Cecil Beaton. Cecil Beaton was summoned to Buckingham Palace to photograph Queen Elizabeth, and out came more versions of this white wardrobe. And of course, between the two of them, they created, in a way, this, this new image. What better hands could she have fallen into than the hands of Norman Hartnell and Cecil Beaton, both of whom had a, an immense flair and style. Flanked by these camp generals, the Queen Mother had rebranded the royal image. They had captured that elusive thing, a fairy tale queen with a human face. Now she would call on them to spin their magic for her daughter's coronation, even as she herself, at the age of 51, was forced to stand aside. It must have been upsetting to see all that terrific deference, etc., etc., all the power going to her daughter and herself elbowed into the shadows. Dealing with her new son-in-law's innovative views was also a challenge. He seemed to be somebody who could threaten the stability of the monarchy in the way that uh, King Edward VIII had done. The Queen's husband, with his whiff of modernity and his international family background, was treated with suspicion by the establishment. Who was this young man, Prince Philip? Philip of Greece? Was he a real prince? Where were his parents, for example? His father had died in France during the war. His, his mother was sort of in Greece, but, but, but who were they? His sisters, well, hadn't they all married Germans and weren't some of those Germans Nazis? He was, to many people, a suspect character, the prince from nowhere. He's got Russian ancestry and German ancestry, and he's completely polyglot. He's very royal, but he is in a sense a European. He doesn't really, in a way, come from anywhere. And I think, you know, this sort of sense of being a slightly displaced person, albeit royal, actually explains quite a lot about him. Philip's background didn't help him win the confidence of his mother-in-law. She felt that Philip was, with all these mysterious European connections, he wasn't a sound chap, he was, he was dangerous. I'm not sure he was really her sort of man. If you look at the friend she had, you know, I don't think he really was. Um, and this is perhaps a rather strong thing to say, but she was tremendously anti-German. 
Philip was perhaps not the Queen Mother's ideal son-in-law, but he had won her daughter's heart. He suddenly found himself at the center of a great ruling dynasty, and he wasn't the sort of person to take a back seat. I think that he felt that what he'd got was a billet for life, which was something that he had singularly lacked in his youth when he'd been, I mean, he had to wear hand-me-downs from Lord Mountbatten. He had, he, he'd really been very badly off. Now, at last, he had found a wife with all the money in the world, and he expected to benefit from this terrific position that he'd now got. At least for the first years of their lives together, it seemed that Philip was able to wear the trousers. His career was taking off in the Navy, and in 1949, he was posted to Malta as first lieutenant to the destroyer, HMS Chequers. When Prince Philip and the Queen, of course she wasn't, she was Princess Elizabeth then, lived in Malta, the sort of ordinary service life of a naval couple, it was probably the happiest, most normal period of their life. The Queen was terribly happy because, of course, she was then quite only a princess and she was away from the public glare and she was shielded by Mountbatten, who was the commander-in-chief locally, um, Uncle Dicky. Um, so it, she became nearest to normal when she was actually in Malta as a naval officer's wife. But this break from royal life was to be short-lived. In July 1951, Philip and Elizabeth were summoned back to London. The king was gravely ill. It was Elizabeth's duty to be by his side and Philip's to be by hers. When six months later the king died, Philip's much-loved naval career was also dealt a deathly blow. He'd always led a very independent private life in the Navy. Uh, he'd been to school here, and uh, I think that suddenly, from being sort of the Queen's husband and playing a quite a big role like that, he suddenly realised, you know, that there he was walking two steps behind her sort of thing, you know. He said, when the late King died, everything changed. Within weeks, the dusty machinery of state creaked into action to plan the coronation. Reassuringly for the Queen Mother, it was headed by the Duke of Norfolk, the man who had organized her husband's coronation. He was a very conservative man. For him, the coronation was all about maintaining tradition and continuity. And that was how the Duke of Norfolk wanted to keep it. When Philip asked the Archbishop of Canterbury how some features relevant to the world today could be introduced into the ceremony, he was brushed off. And this tyranny of tradition extended beyond the coronation and into every area of royal life. Philip and Elizabeth were even forced into an unwelcome house swap. After George VI's death, it was inevitable that the new royal couple, uh, Queen Elizabeth and, and Philip, would have to move into Buckingham Palace. This was something that Philip didn't want. He didn't want to leave Clarence House, which he'd spent a fortune on redecorating. It was all very nice and suited him. It was a small palace, but it was also like a large London home. And they enjoyed it there. They made a proper home of it. And when the Queen became Queen, Prince Philip's idea was that the family should continue at Clarence House. The official business could be done from Buckingham Palace, but their home would continue to be down the mall at Clarence House. He produced a document setting out the reasons why this is the best way forward. His piece of paper was dismissed. The Queen was obviously influenced by Philip, but in the last resort, she had to do what her official advisers told her. And so, when Churchill said they must move into Buckingham Palace, she had to go along with this. Prince Philip's view counted for nothing. The Prime Minister's view went for everything. 
There was another problem. Buckingham Palace already had an occupant, the Queen Mother, and she was in no hurry to downshift to the mere four-storey mansion, Clarence House. I know it sounds strange to say it. She thought it was too small. We would now think it was the perfect sized residence, but of course times have moved on. So Philip found himself reluctantly living with his mother-in-law, surrounded by her camp courtiers. I think it was difficult for Philip when they moved into Buckingham Palace because the, the Queen Mother was there, the Queen's sister was there, and he was surrounded by all these women, and he was a, a, a virile man's man of his own, and he didn't, uh, he didn't, um, he found this rather, uh, I, I, I think he found this rather tiresome. Even the Queen's formidable grandmother, Queen Mary, was still alive and living down the Mall at Marlborough House. If this was hard to live with, the leaden pace of life at Buckingham Palace which had so suited the Queen Mother, was almost intolerable for Philip. When he got there, he found this fusty, old-fashioned setup, and he felt that what was necessary was to modernize the whole place. There were all sorts of people with vested interests in this, and people who had to light the candles, and people who had got to wear particular uniforms and appear at particular times. It was really rather absurd. So he was most impatient with this, and he was most impatient of all with Sir Alan Lassells, the Queen's private secretary, who was the personification of old fashions. And he very much looked down his nose at this brash young naval officer who would come in and try to turn the whole system on its head. If you wanted to send a message to another member of the family in Buckingham Palace, you summoned a footman and you gave him a handwritten note which he put on a salva and he walked half a mile to the other part of the palace and gave it to the other member of the family. Prince Philip said, this is ridiculous. You know, in the Navy, we have walkie-talkies. Why can't we have them in the palace? Well, of course, a certain sort of, um, you know, palace bureaucrat was absolutely appalled at this idea. They'd always used footmen with selfers. You know, how could they possibly do anything else? The courtiers around the Queen, most of them worked for the Queen's father, were very much old-school English public school types, I think Princess Margaret called them, the men with moustaches, men who'd fought in the First World War, who'd all been to the same schools, who looked down on Prince Philip as a foreigner and a penniless foreigner. Even if he might have been royalty, he wasn't first-class royalty. Philip escaped the palace walls through a social life mixing with his type of people. He had had quite a colourful life before he was married, and it didn't take him long to resume the rather rackety existence um, that he had adopted as a young, licentious naval officer after Elizabeth and he got married. And certainly when she was preoccupied with her royal duties, he tended to be off in rather, shall we say, unsuitable company. Amongst those deemed unsuitable was the society photographer Baron Naum. He had photographed the royal wedding and was to become a candidate to take the official coronation portrait. His rival would be the Queen Mother's favourite, Cecil Beaton. While Beaton was notoriously camp, Baron was an infamous philanderer. Well, it was uh, quite often we'd have to go and wake Baron up. Several times I had to sort of go up and shout up the stairs and he'd roll out of bed and there's always some woman there. Prince Philip found him rather uh, fun, amusing. Quite often we uh, helped him with his parties. They were always uh, quite fun sort of parties and uh, various interesting friends would be there, and pretty girls. And I think Prince Philip found him as in a way, a slight escape from 
the rigors of the palace. It was a testosterone-fueled social scene and was populated by bohemian types. Amongst the actors, newspaper editors, artists and authors were David Niven and Peter Ustinov, the spy Kim Philby and the later infamous Stephen Ward. Baron even set up a regular gathering for Philip. They called themselves the Thursday Club. It was a luncheon club dedicated, I suppose, to the idea that weekends for lucky people started on Thursdays and you took Friday off from work, and likewise Saturday and Sunday, and only started again on Monday. It was full of um, faintly raffish, faintly luge people letting off steam, you know, probably having slightly too much to drink, possibly telling slightly off-colour stories. And when he was with Baron at any of these parties, he... Uh, would be very relaxed and he'd enjoy the company. I don't know what happened afterwards, <laughs> anything, anything might have done. These Soho nights were just a short escape. At home, Philip's efforts at reform were being blocked, even by the one person he might have expected to be an ally. Some marriages work because the people are very similar, some work because the people are very different. The Queen and Prince Philip are very different people. She sided with the old guard. She is a traditionalist. She followed in the footsteps of her father. So there is a tension there. She was the personification herself of duty, of obedience. She knew that this was what she was having to sacrifice her own satisfactions to, 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 to be what she was. And therefore, uh, there was inevitably a, 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 a good deal of friction with her husband. And his position wasn't made any easier by the presence in the palace of the formidable Queen Mother. One of the reasons Philip felt so frustrated by the court was that his mother-in-law was very much a power behind the throne, and she was no modernizer. The Queen Mother was still living in Buckingham Palace, although convention demanded she move out to make way for her daughter. When Cecil Beaton visited her, he wrote that he suspected the heating had been turned off to try and freeze her out. Some of the higher up servants of the palace couldn't think why the Queen Mother stayed on here so long. When I passed by the Queen Mother's old rooms, I noticed that the walls were bare, the furniture had been taken away, and the rooms were below freezing. But it wasn't just her home she was hanging on to. And there to help was her ally, Winston Churchill. She was encouraged by Churchill to continue in public life, and actually she was quite pleased to do that. So she resumed the royal life, but had to play second fiddle, obviously, to her own daughter. Traditionally, a dowager queen would retire into the shadows, but this wasn't the case for the 52-year-old queen mother. Symbolically, Elizabeth ordered a dispatch box to be made for her and even made her a councillor of state, the first dowager queen in British history to become one. Although Philip was boxed in by the forces of tradition, he could see one way of making an impact on the House of Windsor. Perhaps the dynasty could have a new name, his name. There were issues here, of course. What was his family name? Uh, his family name uh, ended in the word Glücksburg. Well, it was quite complicated, and I don't think anyone thought he was going to be called Glücksburg. He changed his name to Mountbatten when he became engaged to the Queen. Uh, so was, he going to, was the royal house to be called Mountbatten? It was very important to his uncle, Lord Mountbatten, who saw himself as a, as a, as a sort of kingmaker, as a power behind the throne, and it mattered a lot to him that um, he should be in some way associated with a royal house which included the word Mountbatten. Shortly after Elizabeth's succession, Mountbatten boasted at a dinner party that the house of Mountbatten now ruled. This got back to the Queen Mother and the Queen and Churchill, all of whom were horrified. I think I know exactly what the Queen Mother thought about Lord Mountbatten. I think I know pretty much what Lord Mountbatten thought about the Queen Mother. 
I think there was what you call a want of sympathy between the two of them and a considerable distrust on her part. Philip threw himself into the campaign to alter the family name with a brisk naval efficiency. When Prince Philip submitted a memo to the cabinet arguing in a very rational and moderate way that perhaps the royal family's name should now change from Windsor to Mountbatten, the cabinet unanimously, with the support of the rest of the royal family, the cabinet unanimously decided to keep the name of Windsor. And Prince Philip, I think he was upset about that because, um, you know, that, that was about the, the only sort of dynastic contribution that he could make. That did infuriate him. He wasn't hung up on the name Mountbatten. I think it annoys him when people think he was obsessed that the family should be called Mountbatten. It was the principle that he was not able to hand on to his children his family name. The stakes for Philip were high. A name change would have acknowledged his status. But on the 9th of April, 1952, the Queen, siding with her family and advisers, signed a royal proclamation stating her descendants will be called Windsor. Philip allegedly responded to the news. I'm just a bloody amoeba. I'm the only man in the country not allowed to give his name to his children. He did feel in some ways emasculated by this, infuriated, angered, antagonized. And I think it must have been difficult for the Queen in some ways because of not wanting to hurt her husband. You know, to an extent, he was pushed on to one side. So I think that from the point of view of actually maintaining you know, good marital relations, it was quite important that Prince Philip should be seen to have a, a job. Recognising Philip's mounting frustration, she hoped to compensate him in some ways by giving him complete control over their children's education and over the royal estates. But in a more public gesture, Elizabeth also made Philip head of the coronation committee. The coronation was to be the biggest royal event of the 20th century. And Philip threw himself into the organization with his characteristic gusto. There were lots of Commonwealth troops coming to the United Kingdom. They were stationed all over the country. And the Duke of Edinburgh, as chairman of the commission, thought that he should go and visit them all. Troops from around the empire, around the Commonwealth. So, he looked at the logistics, he did this with his own private secretary, uh, a guy called Mike Parker. The pair of them sat down with some maps, worked out where everybody was, decided that the best way to do this would be by helicopter. That's the way it should be done, dynamically. They got a helicopter from the Royal Navy, Philip was in the Royal Navy, they borrowed this helicopter, and off they went to visit all these troops. Well, as the Duke of Edinburgh said to me, it caused quite a ruckus. And Churchill was furious because as far as he was concerned, you know, one travelled on horseback, basically, and he'd taken part in the last cavalry charge in British history. And helicopters were the invention of the devil. And he actually said to Prince Philip, or said to his query, is Prince Philip trying to kill off the entire royal family? What's he doing? You know, I don't want him travelling about in helicopters. There was a lot of pettifogging bureaucracy. He had not sought the necessary permissions to do this. He just got on and done it. And his secretary, Mike Parker, was hauled in to 10 Downing Street and wrapped over the knuckles, given a severe dressing down by the prime minister himself. So the chairman of the coronation commission was told in no uncertain terms, you've got to do it our way, not your way. To make it worse, it became clear that Philip had no real power at all. They did their best to involve Prince Philip, but the real power wasn't in his hands. The real power was in the hands of his deputy chairman, the Duke of Norfolk, chief butler of all England, the man who traditionally runs these kinds of affairs. But the modern world couldn't be totally excluded. Television was in its infancy, this new medium had never been a factor in previous coronations. Would it be welcomed or rejected by the royals? In the early days of post-war television, we used to televise any royal occasion that we possibly could. And so when the coronation, uh, that, that was clearly 
going to be the most wonderful occasion of all if we could get permission to televise it. Prince Philip, with an influence from Baron, I think, uh, was all for it. And this was modernising, you know, we're changing from old type royalty to a new type royalty. This was the age of television, and he would undoubtedly have been wholly in favour of the televising of the coronation. But it was the Queen who had to be persuaded. And once again, Philip was out on a limb. The Queen, I believe, wasn't very keen on having it televised because it was a very solemn, it was a religious thing, a service, you know. The Queen was uneasy with cameras. She couldn't unbend, she was nervous, she was not spontaneous. But as ever, it wasn't only the Queen's decision. The Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, was also opposed to allowing television cameras in the Abbey. He didn't want the mystique of the monarchy to be overexposed. Churchill was very against it. He said a religious ceremony should not become a theatrical performance. The BBC request was refused by the Duke of Norfolk, the Coronation Committee and the Cabinet. There was a good deal of apprehension uh, and um, uh, almost a blank refusal. I think on the grounds of additional lighting and the strain that it would have, extra strain that it would impose upon a young queen uh, during the service. The problem about televising the royals is that, as Sir Alan Lassells, the private secretary to the queen, kept insisting, you were letting daylight in upon the magic. You were revealing what was going on behind the scenes. You were making a you were creating, perhaps, what came to be known as the royal soap opera. It just went on week after week. Every time they said no, we tried to find a reason why they should have said yes. For the forces of tradition, it wasn't just a case of who would watch the coronation, but what it would look like. The Queen Mother was making sure that it would reflect the look that she had created as Queen. Princess Elizabeth had already gone and had a wonderful wedding dress created for her by Hartnell in 1947. And so when it came to a grand gown, which was going to be embroidered again, um, the coronation dress was obviously going to be commissioned that Mr Hartnell would receive. The Queen really is not that interested in clothes, not like her mother who loved clothes for clothes' sake. The Queen looks upon all her clothes as a sort of working wardrobe to carry out the duties for which she is the monarch. Elizabeth's disinterest in clothes gave the Queen Mother the opportunity to make her mark, as Hartnell soon discovered on a trip to Sandringham. To his surprise and rather shock, he got there and he found both the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret there, eagerly waiting to see what he was going to produce, uh, which he found slightly. Uh, unnerving, but uh, they were very enthusiastic and obviously ordered their gowns from him too. Hartnell would not only be designing the coronation robe. For the first time, a coronation would have a coordinated look. And the Queen Mother would also make sure she influenced who would be wearing some of these beautiful clothes, including the maids of honour. My parents had known the Queen Mother. In fact, my father knew the Queen Mother when he was a young man and she was a young girl in Scotland. And so he'd known her for a very long time. And they both knew the late King and Queen Mother. And, and I was the right age. And um, I think that's it's what I call accident of birth. She'd been a great friend of my parents. And my father had been a, a query to the Duke of York before the war. Um, so, and we were also chosen the way we looked, our figures, and we were very carefully graded, two very tall girls at the back, Rosie Spencer Churchill and Moira Hamilton. The coronation was to be a grand performance, rehearsed to perfection. I mean, we were drilled by the Duke of Norfolk. Um, like soldiers, we were. Every movement was worked out in advance. We used to go to the Abbey quite often, actually, and rehearse. But we never rehearsed with the Queen, except at Buckingham Palace when she wore a sheet and we sort of wandered up and down behind her. 
As Coronation Day drew closer, the rehearsals became more urgent. The Queen Mother's camp was winning hands down. But there was increasing concern about how the event would be presented to the wider world. For Philip, this was an opportunity. The BBC was still fighting to get their cameras in. And who would immortalize the day in photographs? The Queen Mother's favorite, the Queenly Beaton? Or Philip's friend, the playful socialite, Baron? Prince Philip wanted Baron, his partner from his nights out in Soho, to take the coronation photographs. Baron would have been a natural person to take the coronation pictures, but um, Prince Philip was only the chairman of the coronation commission. He was not Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. The Queen Mother had a different idea. She was determined that the Hartnell beaten magic that had served her so well would also work for her daughter. We did three sessions with the Queen Mother that I remember. One was in the garden and uh, in Buckingham Palace, and then one was in, I think, the green room. And then it was in the green room that uh, he had a long chat with the uh, Queen Mother. I remember him saying to the Queen Mother that he'd very much like to photograph the Queen. And she said, yes, she thought that it would be possible. I think she was pretty good at getting her own way when she wanted to, if she felt it was important. Beaton himself recalled his relief in his diary. Baron, a most unexpected friend of Prince Philip's, has been taking all the recent pictures. So the call saying the Queen wanted me to do her personal coronation pictures comes as an enormous relief. I also had a short opportunity to thank the Queen Mother for what I am sure must have been her help in bringing about this coup for me. She laughed knowingly with one finger high in the air. It was another victory for the Queen Mother, maybe now secure in her new position. Just weeks before the coronation, she finally left Buckingham Palace for her newly decorated home at Clarence House. At last, Philip could be master of his own home there was also still an opportunity to throw a little 20th century light onto the ancient coronation ritual. The BBC decided to take a chance on public opinion. What happened was that the BBC leaked the fact that this cabal of the establishment had decided not to televise. And then there was a media storm. I'm afraid we did adopt a bit of spin because if ever we could leak any information that we thought was in our favour, then we'd try and get it into the press, uh, hoping that the government and the palace would read it. And we had a, a very good friend in George Campy because every time we got a no, he'd come out with a great big article saying, it seems that they're not going to allow television in the Abbey and they should. The spin had worked. In a public opinion poll, 78% voted in favour of televising the day. It clearly wasn't just Philip who wanted to propel the royal family into the 20th century. And eventually a telephone call came. Yes, you have permission. And from that moment on, it was wonderful. This time, Philip's view chimed with popular opinion. At last, the forces of tradition had to back down. television would give unprecedented live access to the ceremony. Any mistakes would be witnessed by millions. The mystery of the monarchy had never been so exposed. On the 2nd of June, 1953, after 16 months of preparation, Coronation Day finally arrived. The nation was in a receptive mood and some were even prepared to embrace a bizarre request. At that stage, Monarchy had become a kind of state religion, really. It had become a form of Shintoism. Um, and I think this is best illustrated by the order that went out to naval ratings in the RNVR who were going to line the route. Um, and the order went out to them that they should refrain from alcohol 
and sexual intercourse for at least 48 hours before they lined the route of the procession, because otherwise they might be seen to contaminate the royal juju. The lavish ceremony and the charisma of the beautiful young queen worked its magic. On the day, Elizabeth could put the wrangles of the last 16 months behind her. Finally, it was her moment. She was very cool, very calm, and she looked so young and so vulnerable, and it was a very solemn moment. And um, I could feel a lump coming in my throat at that time. I thought, goodness, what responsibility the rest of her life. Philip, Duke of Edinburgh on that day, was merely an attendant lord. He was the most significant attendant lord, but that's what he was. He did not take part in the coronation. The queen arrived with him, but she processed alone. She was crowned alone. It was her day, her moment. The queen mother too was watching her daughter's flawless performance from a front row seat. I think the Queen Mother must have very mixed feelings because I, she was very, very sad when the King died. I mean, you know, they had such a wonderful married life together. And uh, on the other hand, I think she was enormously proud, obviously, of the Queen, uh, you know, uh, who, who was magnificent and has been magnificent ever since. Although Philip was technically just another of the Queen's subjects, he was at least the first among equals during the ceremony. He took his place in front of the peers with the Duke of Gloucester and the Duke of Kent as the three royal dukes, and each in turn paid homage to the Queen, promising to be liege man of life and limb and so forth, which was, in a sense, to, I suppose, mark you know, his particular role. Millions of viewers were entranced by the spectacle, unaware that behind the scenes, some family tensions continued. When they returned to the palace for the official photographs, Philip was no longer on his best behavior. He was a bit tetchy, but he wasn't rude or anything like that, you know, just, he just wanted to get on with the job. Thought, uh, come on, hurry up, let's get on with it and finish and go. Well, Cecil Beaton was sort of, you know, in a rather a stew, actually, sort of hopping up and down, and uh, we were all arranged, and the Duke of Edinburgh, um, I think he was an amateur photographer anyway. He kept on sort of saying, no, you've got to be there. And in the end, Cecil Peterson said, look, I'm taking the photographs. You know, I think I'd better get on with it. Beaton recorded the atmosphere in his diary. The Duke of Edinburgh stood by making wry jokes. His lips pursed in a smile that put the fear of God into me. I believe he doesn't approve or like me. Perhaps he was disappointed that his friend Baron wasn't doing this job today. Overall, the coronation had been a stunning success for the traditionalists. The society diarist Chips Channon wrote, what a day for England and the traditional forces of the world. Shall we ever see the like again? Just as Philip had hoped, an ancient ritual had been given new life by television. The nation was entranced by the spectacle. And the following day, it would be broadcast around the world. Paradoxically, the people got a better view than, than the knobs did, um, because the, the ceremony was shown on television. It was a, a commercial that went on all day, which 27 million people saw, 10 million of them who, who'd never seen television before in their lives. It was the most extraordinary plug for the monarchical system that had ever occurred. I think the Queen and Prince Philip were absolutely right to let the cameras in. 
it made the monarchy seem to be at once the protector of tradition, history, custom, and at the same time a symbol of progress, dynamism, vitality. That almost impossible juggling act that the monarchy has always had to do to embody the nation's past, present and future. But this nod to modernity had an impact that no one in 1953 could ever have foreseen. The media would from now on record not just the triumphs of the royal family, but also its trials. With hindsight, it was a huge mistake. Because as Churchill predicted, once you let the mass media in to this very ancient and actually religious ceremony, you're never going to get rid of the mass media. And for Philip personally, there was another symbolic victory. Almost a decade after the coronation, the snub over the family name was reversed. Finally, in 1960, an order in council decreed that some of those descendants, but not the heirs of Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip, should hold the surname Mountbatten-Windsor.